Our speaker for today is Russ Laughlin. He was born and raised in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And God used Pathfinders, Adventist education, and summer camp ministries to call him to the ministry. He is a graduate of Southern and Andrews Universities. He has pastored three, a three-church district in South Florida and has been a youth pastor in Illinois and Texas. Currently, he is the Vice President for Spiritual Development at Southwestern Adventist University. While serving as the Associate Pastor for Youth Ministries in Hinsdale, Illinois, he began to realize the importance of recruiting, mentoring, and empowering youth and young adults in ministry. At Southwestern, Russ and his team of student chaplains lead the Friday night worships. They work together with area churches to share information in the Options newsletter, a weekly update on spiritual fellowship options for students. They promote small groups and student-led Bible studies. They coordinate service and mission opportunities for the students to use their gifts for Christ. Russ married his high school sweetheart, Jean, and they have two children. Thank you, Pastor Russ, for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. Church family, thank you. Pastor uh, Charles, thank you for sharing your pulpit. And uh, what a privilege to be here on Adventist Education Sabbath. I bring greetings from my president, Dr. Kenneth, or Dr. Ken Shaw. Um, he sends greetings. It is great to be part of Adventist education. You have seen uh, our kids up here on front leading worship, and, and I was jotting some notes. Um, I probably could just sit down right now They've already said, I will I've decided to follow Jesus, and you can have all this world, just give me Jesus. There's no turning back, and that's probably enough said. May they and we always live by that model. I was looking in your bulletin also, though. I, I don't know if you have looked at your bulletin. Uh, the announcements were brought out, that was, that's fascinating. But one of the things that I look at as a pastor is the health of the church financially. And I praise God that you are faithful in returning your tithes and offerings. That helps to equip Adventist education. And then to see a number of, stu uh, of children in, in a church. As a youth pastor by heart, oh, that does my heart good to see kids in church. Thank you for ministering. And then I, I have a, a sort of a, I guess it could be perceived as selfish, thank you for having student teachers here. You guys, we're proud of you at Southwestern, and I can tell this congregation is proud of you as well. Thank you for uh, representing God well in a, in a class every day, and faculty, administration of this school. I recognize that sometimes it's a challenge but you know what? These kids are worth it. You might have heard that at Southwestern we were in a capital campaign. I, I can't keep quiet about this because yesterday was a huge day for Southwestern. It's a sister school of here. We had a goal of reaching $8 million and everyone told us it was impossible. Honestly, we thought it was impossible too, so we prayed about it. And yesterday, $8,035,000 matching grant. There'll be a new nursing and administration building uh, going up uh, probably starting in, in February. And that leads me to where we're going in our scripture today or in, in, our, in, in our scriptural study because I want to take us into God's word. When a miracles happen in the context of Adventist education, we just have to get excited. And I noticed that there's some uh, a white miracle out here 
and let's see if I can get, ac uh, I think it's over this direction, am I right? Okay, that just didn't happen, did it? And I'm pretty sure that board members, you thought that would never happen. And there's no way it could come together. And I know that we think of concrete not in mir miraculous terms, but when you have guests that come onto your campus to come chur to church, it says something about your value of them when they have a nice place to park their car. And even more than that, when they have space to park their car. Have you ever lost anything? You, you and Cleburne, I, I recognize you probably never lose anything. It's just people that live in Keene that lose things. And it's, it's you know, have you ever noticed that when you um, set your uh, cell phone on the bedside stand, you can put it there and you can walk all around the house and be perfectly at peace with it being beside your bedside stand and everything's good because you know that's where it's at. You can live maybe even a couple hours without it. But as soon as you realize you don't know where it is, the whole world comes crashing down. Now, maybe you and Cleburne don't have to worry about that. Maybe it's just me. But I struggle that when I think I have lost something, the world stops and I try to go find what I'm looking for. Are, are you that way? Does it work that way in Cleveland? Good. Because I was working at, at, at summer camp, and, and as the principal said, summer camp, Adventist education, and Pathfinders really shaped my life. They put a calling upon my life to live for God unreservedly. And I was working at summer camp, and it was just a few years ago. I was in Texas Conference, uh, the last summer of Nameless Valley Ranch. And so I got off of the boats, got the kids up and going, and I was cleaning up the area. I left, I was the last one out. I took all the equipment in the, in the van that has all the storage. I got back to camp, and I'm, everything is a glorious day. Because see, when you don't think about your cell phone, life is good, right? And it was after supper, right about campfire time, that I realized I didn't know where my cell phone was and so I began looking and I realized that in my backpack a small hole had become a larger hole that was capable of dropping a phone out of now you can say okay cell phones are not that bad and if your plan is right it's not too big of a deal this phone belonged to the church I was pastoring at the time and you know your mind starts racing. I, there's probably all kinds of emergencies happening in the world that everyone on, under, the, uh, under the planet is calling your cell phone needing to talk to you. And I begin looking. I retrace all my steps. I go back to the boats. I, I walked all the steps down. I walked the dock. I walked all over camp. I looked all over my room. And no cell phone. And it was borrowed. You ever been there? Let's go to God's word. God's Word has a really cool story. Um, as you saw the title in the bulletin, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't pick it by accident. As I was studying the history of Southwestern, did you know that in one of our writings, uh, uh, recruiting students, it said, bring your ax and come to Southwestern? We don't use that on our recruiting anymore. Okay, I just want you to know that we've, we've taken that out. But when they were found in the organization almost 100 years ago, or a little over 100 years ago, they said, bring your ax and help us cut down trees. We're building a new school, and it's about time maybe we should think about pulling our axes out again. In, in 2 Kings chapter 6, it begins with these words. I'm reading from the New International Version. The company of the prophets said to Elijah, Elisha, look, the place where we meet is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place for us to live. And he said, go. Then one of them said, won't you come with, uh, please come with your servants. I will, Elisha said. And he went to, with them. They went to the Jordan, began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried. 
It was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. May I pray with you? Heavenly Father, we have heard your word. Now we need to hear your voice. Speak to us on this Adventist education Sabbath. Renew our passion for you and the calling that you have placed on this congregation. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I, I wanna start with the very first words of, of the passage. It says in my Bible, and the company of the prophets. We know that as the school of the prophets. In the context of God's education is the story we're reading. And, and I wanna pause back a little bit because I was thinking about this. If I could go to any school, full ride scholarship to any school throughout history, which school would I go to? I mean, you have the name ones, the Ivy Leagues. You have all kinds of schools around the world. We have Adventist campuses abroad and really cool opportunities. Maybe to go into one of those uh, Greek universities or maybe be at the University of Babylon with Daniel and his friends and, and be one of those four. I mean, that would be pretty cool. And then I was reading a little more and I thought, no, no. I want to be at the School of the Prophets when Elijah, Elisha is there. You see, around Elisha and the school of the prophets, just look at your Bible with me. Let's look at the context a little bit. You go back just a couple of pages and you start to see the context and you see that it starts out with the widow's oil. We're told in the spirit of prophecy that the widow, her husband, had been associated with the school of the prophets. That's happening in the context of the school of the prophets. And oh man, that's a cool story. Lady has broke, has nothing, and Elisha says, what do you have? And she says, all I got is a little bit of oil. Now, we know that oil stands for the Holy Spirit, at least in the temple service, and, and he says, okay, get all of the, the, the pitchers and, and bowls and everything you, that will hold oil, and the, the boys go out and they get as much as they can, and she starts pouring and keeps pouring and keeps pouring and fills every one of those up. And... and they take them out and they sell it, they pay off the debt, and there's abundance that is left, and the prophet says, live off of the rest. Oh, what a cool story. In the context of Adventist education, we find the Holy Spirit pouring through the teacher in that situation, being flowing through to the vessels and going out, and there's more than enough. But we can't stop there. School of the Prophets, pretty exciting. You see, you keep turning a page and, and you see that one of the students goes out and adds something to the food. Uh, that would never happen at our school because I know if you guys ever did a recipe, the kids make it perfectly, right? And they never put too much salt in where they're supposed to be putting sugar or any of that kind of stuff. And they say, death in the pot. And their supper, all they have for food for that, for that day is poisoned. And the prophet performs a miracle and that food becomes edible and they are blessed by it and in the context of Adventist education, God can take something that used to be no good and make it powerfully good. And then there's the feeding of a hundred and we think of the feeding of the thousands. These are foretaste miracles of what Jesus is gonna do. It's really cool. And there's only a little bit of bread and Elijah says, feed them, and they say, hey, there's not enough, and guess what? In the Adventist educational school system, it seems like we never have enough, does it? And yet God always stretches it. Poor Kip has to deal with technology at Southwestern. There's never enough time. There are never enough computers. There's never enough, and yet somehow God stretches it every single day. Oh, and then there's that story of Naaman. Oh, is that cool or what? That's still, it's, it's hidden in the, in the context of the school of the prophets and you got this pagan coming in and taking note that something's happening around Elijah the prophet and he comes in and there's that great cleansing that happens. Oh man, that's the context and it takes us right into this story. And the next story 
is where God opens blinded eyes and I believe that Adventist education helps to open eyes that have been blinded. But back to our story for today. The company of prophets with Elisha right there and there's a problem. Aren't you glad that in Adventist education there are no problems? We, we're gonna, that's what we teach at Southwestern, our teachers, right? Our student teachers, when you get out there, you will walk into a classroom and all, everybody will love you. There are never problems at Adventist schools. That's why we want to teach you to be there. Is that what, is that what Mr. Dr. Berkner has taught you all? It's not the way we teach it, is it? Even in the context of God's church and God's school, there are going to be problems. And the problem happens, and apparently a committee is formed. The Bible doesn't tell us that, but pastor, we have building committees, right? And we, we, we strategize and we plan and we get creative and there's a parking lot that comes out of it, right? And so everything, the, the plan is together. They're having a great time planning and everybody says, we need a new school. We need a place, a new dorm. Well, what should we do? Let's go talk to the prophet. Let's see if we can get his approval and if we can get his approval, then we're going, so who's gonna be, oh, you're the chair of this committee? Chair goes in and says, uh, Prophet Elijah, um, we've been thinking we're a little cramped in our quarters and we came up with a plan. We're gonna go down to the river, we're gonna cut down a tree each and we're gonna bring it up and we're gonna, we're gonna make a new, a new building here. Uh, do we have permission to do this? And he says, go. Back in chapter two, it talks about 50 of the prophets, and it may be that, that, that we're in that school. It may be that that school had 50, okay? So if that's the same school, and it, it, the context hints that it might have been, 49 of them take off with their axes to go down and do their business of cutting trees. And what does it say here? He says go, then verse three, how many of them came back? Does it say, do you see it in your Bible? Then how many of them? It says one. So apparently 49 are, have, have gotten the permission to go and only one of them thinks about it and says, wait a second, we're going to do God's work. Don't we need to have God with us? See, Elisha was the representation of God to those people. He was his prophet. And as they're going on their way about God's business, they chose not to go into that without God going with them. And the one comes back and says, hey, uh, just one more question, prophet. Would you come with us? And he said, yes. I, I thought about that this week as I was studying. What if the prophet had chosen, or what if the people had not asked Elisha to go with them? This story would not have made it in the Bible, would it? And I think there's some really cool stuff in this. I better hasten on, time is flying. Elisha says, I will and he went with them. And so now there is uh, power going with them. And have you ever been on something where it really comes together really nicely? I mean, that parking lot looks good and we, we're like pumped and everything's good and it's going strong and there's progress happening. It's happening within budget. It's happening within the time frame that it's supposed to. I mean, everybody is on task and everything is going beautifully and that's the way the church always operates. That's the way the school oper always operates, right? Even with God going with us, even with his blessing, sometimes problems arise. Have you ever noticed that? And they're doing their duty and the guy's cutting and he cuts and as he swings, the stick of the ax keeps going but the iron centrifugal force takes it on off and there's a splash. Now I don't know about you, I think it's in a little boy's DNA. And I, I got a couple men, I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you, see if you're like me. When you get around water, do you like to pick up rocks and throw it into a lake? Are you, good, I got a brother here, all right? I, when I get by a lake, even as an adult, I have to hold myself back from throwing lakes, uh, rocks into the, into the water. Because there's something about that kerplunk. It, it, you, do, do you know what I'm talking about? Where you throw it in and go, boom, boom, and you see that splash? 
it's really fun unless it happens to be something that's valuable to you that's making that kerplunk, right? And so the ax goes like this and the head goes like this and the kid's eyes get wide and when he can get his mouth back, he goes, prophet, it was borrowed. Have, have you ever felt that? You beg to borrow your dad's car. You're 17 years old and there's a fender bender. How do you like making that phone call home? Hopeless. The kid is so poor he can't even afford his own acts. He's borrowed one. And so now you have a problem or a crisis if you please. And the prophet walks up and says, where did it, where did it go? And he cuts off a branch. Did you catch that? He cuts off a stick. It makes no human sense. He cuts that branch off. He throws it into the water. And what happens? It defies all human logic. A piece of iron which has recently sunk begins to float. Now, what could have happened, what could have happened is they could have formed a committee, right? And they could have developed a search and rescue process, right? Just like lifeguarding, you go this way and then you go this way and you go this way and you got a group going this way and eventually you find the ax head, right? They could have started an ax fund and started to raise money for a new ax. They could have just said, hey, the ax head wasn't worth anything, let's go home. We got 10 other axes or 20 other axes and just left it be. But instead they consult the prophet and the prophet does something that defies all logic until you realize that one of the prophets, Zephaniah, talks about, wait a second, is that, is that let me get to here, I open my, my, my notes here. Zechariah 3, verse 8, talks about a branch being cut off. And that branch is a prophetic representation of Jesus Christ. Now let's come back and look at the symbols. Do you know what the Jordan means? The Jordan mean, River means to descend. That river is descending, flowing fairly rapidly. There's been miracles happening. Children of Israel have crossed through on dry land through that same river. Prophet Elijah and Elisha have struck the water and parted it and walked through again. In that same river, a guy named Naaman has been cleansed and in years to come, a gentleman named Jesus is going to be baptized in that same river. Lots of stuff happening in that river. If we are going to look a little bit further, the book of Revelation talks about the enemy of God spewing out water. And then waters in the book of Revelation also talk, or refer to people. So this axe head falls into this murky river, one that, the, that Naaman did not want to even go in. It's lost in the muck and the mire at the bottom of that river. I've been to Lake Wachita. I camp there a lot. The water's clear. You can see down eight to ten feet. I threw an anchor in and the rope came un attached to it. It was a little mushroom anchor. And the next thing I knew, I had a nice piece of rope. And so I put my mask on and I went down and I snorkeled all through there trying to find that anchor in beautifully clear water. I never came up and it was only about nine or 10 feet deep there. So somewhere up in Lake Wachita, if you want, right near the state park, if you wanna go snorkeling, you might be able to find a nice anchor. I never found it. And here there's this hopeless situation and a branch is cut off. Did you catch hopeless situation? and it's thrown and it begins to float. And what is the next command the prophet says to do? 
He is to what? He is to reach out. Now, come on. It's, 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 it's really cool what's going on so far. If it's, if it's floating already, it could have just jumped right up and gone right back onto the stick, right? I mean, that would have been impressive, wouldn't it? I mean, somebody would have said, hey, can I see that in slow motion? <laughs> Jesus didn't do it because he doesn't want us to think that magic happens in the context of Adventist education. He wants us to understand that miracles happen. And the miracle happened because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, the branch, I will do what? Draw all men to me. And that ax head, which was, has a function to work within the school of the prophets to help build another school, is drawn, lost is drawn back and it was human power that reached out there, took it and replaced it back onto the handle. And I believe that's where Adventist education comes in. You see, there are a number of lost in the world. They're in that whole river. It, it, they're, they're, it, it's rivers flowing by, it's going fast. We cannot find them but Adventist education has one purpose, and that is to draw people to Jesus. I recognize that they're gonna learn math, and they're gonna learn science, and they're gonna do reading, and they're gonna do all these other things that are very, very important, but they're going to do it in the context of helping young minds know Jesus. We just heard them quote to us what their function is, to go out and be fishers of men. The role of Adventist education, the school of the prophets modern day, is to help our students to understand that whatever vocation they are called to, I, I don't care what their major is or going to be. You're not talking majors yet, I know. It doesn't matter what major you're gonna be talking about. Your function is to be used by God to help take ax heads that are valuable but lost and get them back into service for God. Amen. And that's why we have Adventist education. Teachers who are dedicated to being a part, an extension of what God is wanting to do to our children and in our children. I'd love to tell you there's no problems in Adventist education. But if we look at the schools of the prophet, there were crises that happened. Not enough room. A borrowed ax head lost. But there's power in Adventist education as well. There's a drawing power to draw even the lost to be put back into service for God. Ellen White says, we have nothing to fear about the future except as we forget how God has led in the past. If you look at the history of Adventist education, it has trained young minds to become great leaders for God. And it has still the same purpose. And it's happening right here in Cleburne. And I'm so grateful I think in terms of how easy it is for me to forget how God has led in the past. And that evening at Nameless Valley, I prayed, I searched, and finally realized that my phone was, even though it was waterproof, was probably at the bottom of the lake. And I walked in the next day, down the stairs, and gave one last shot and as I was walking down the stairs, the owner of the marina came out and said, hey, did you lose your phone yesterday? <laughs> Apparently, it had dropped on the dock, and he had spotted it, and he returned it back to me. You see, we have something far more valuable than cell phones. We have no idea how God will use these young minds. The mission service that they will have, whether it be overseas or right here in Cleburne, 
or Dallas-Fort Worth, but we want them to be the sharpest tool in the hand of God. Faculty, thank you. Thank you for helping our students understand scripture and to say it, for inviting them and encouraging them to be fishers of men. Church family, thank you for your support. Financially, volunteering in the classroom, the work bees around the church, making this a home where Adventist education can have a warm spot in this congregation. We don't know what will happen. We don't know what happened with that school of the prophets. We don't know where, if any of them went on to do great things, we have no idea. But we do know that one afternoon, a miracle happened in the context of the school of the prophet. And I would suggest that every day in Adventist education, miracles happen. We just don't see them all. May God bless you as you continue to support Adventist education and may your church and this community be changed because God is being taught in, on this campus. May God bless you.